Members, it is the scheduled time now, and we have formed a quorum, so we can begin. Let me remind you. So when you attend this food safety and environmental hygiene panel, you need to switch on the virtual background on Zoom with a colored background. So you know that there are orange, green, and purple uh, for the background. And for members who are in attendance, you must be within the Hong Kong territory, okay? If there are no other questions, then we will begin now. Since the last meeting, there was information paper issued. So there was one issued by the Secretariat. So it is in the uh, agenda for um, 1st of April. And the paper is a response from the Tourism Commission under the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau to Mr. Tommy Jung's letter dated 28th January 2022 concerning issues relating to the food truck pilot scheme. The details are set out in the paper, so please read it. Any other questions? No, then agenda item two, date of next meeting and items for discussion. So, okay. The Secretariat has already sent out to members the list of outstanding items for discussion. Paper number CB2170 stroke 202201. Date of next meeting will be 10th of May, 2022, Tuesday, 2.30 p.m. The government proposed to discuss the following. So concerning private um, column barrier, so retention of two supernumerary directorate posts in the food and environmental hygiene department for the regulation of private column barrier, that's item one. And number two, proposed amendments to the prevention of cruelty to animals ordinance cap 169. So if members agree, then in the May regular meeting, we will discuss these two items. Basically, we will provide for two hours for the meeting, which means that it will end at 4.30. As I said at the beginning, concerning uh, Mr. Tommy Jung's um, letter on food truck pilot scheme, we asked that the administration should respond to Mr. Jung, but so far, our panel has not received any response. So this was as of uh, the afternoon of 1st April. I don't think we have received any reply even now. So on the 30th of May, the food truck pilot scheme will come to an end. So there, there is some urgency. So if members don't object, I hope that this item can be included in the, far, uh, in the May panel meeting so that we can perhaps extend the meeting for half an hour and then members can express their views on this quite urgent item. Any objection from members? No objection. Then, okay, that will be done. So are we going to have the meeting half an hour earlier or are we going to extend the meeting for half an hour so that it will end a bit later? I will work with the secretariat. Okay, item three, food surveillance program and food supply. Let's invite the administration representatives to come in. So if you are ready, then uh, please go through your paper. Members, um, after the administration has briefed us on the paper, I will invite you to raise your hands. There is no need for you to raise hands now, okay? Let's wait for the presentation from the government. Thank you, Chairman, members. Food surveillance program is to ensure food safety in Hong Kong, which is important. In 2021, CFS implements the FSP and around uh, 66,300 food samples were inspected with overall satisfaction rate of 99.9% .9 because of COVID-19. Last year, CFS and, uh, enhanced the sampling of online uh, food, especially the uh, surveillance of uh, online takeaway platform. The situation is satisfactory and concerning the use of chilled uh, meat being disguised as fresh meat, and also um, chilled meat smuggling. Work has been done to combat that. The details are set out in the paper. Besides, we also talked about CFS work under COVID-19, especially in relation to inspection of frozen food. And so far, more than 30,000 imported frozen food and packaging samples were um, checked. And then 
concerning the um, hold and test uh, arrangement, well, this is uh, in place. So this is to guard against risk from imported uh, frozen food. And then uh, concerning the task force on uh, supplies from the mainland, the two governments had active coordination and the marine uh, transport route is being um, worked on to ensure that there will be a sufficient stable supply of food from the mainland to Hong Kong. Once again, we need to thank the central government, um, Guangdong and Shenzhen government for their help. And various checks and inspections will be done to ensure food safety. Our colleagues and also um, uh, the doctor from CFS will be happy to take members' questions. Thank you. For this item, well, it is a report on the food surveillance program. However, because of uh, COVID-19, I think uh, food safety is also very important. So that's why the two items are uh, combined as one here. Okay, helpers, can you clear the raise hand signals? I will ask you to raise hands later. Okay, three, two, one, please go ahead and raise hands if necessary. So including me, 10 all together. This item will be discussed till uh, 535. So there are 10. So I hope that uh, all members will, be, will have time to ask questions. So four minutes for both question and answer. And then uh, at the last 15 seconds, you will see the timer. Chen Wing Yan, Chen Pui Leng, Tan Ka Piu, Leng Yuk Wai, Yang Wing Ki, Chen Ha Yan, uh, Tommy Zhang, Tai Wai Chun, Siu Ka Fai, and I myself. Four minutes for both Q&A. Mr. Chen first, uh, Ms. Chen first, Chen Wing Yan. Thank you, Chairman. Well, under the pandemic, um, online shopping is very popular. In the paper, we can see that our department actually uh, does surveillance of online stores. Now, actually online food is global and food safety is a big challenge as a result. For individually packaged snacks, very often they are supplied from Taiwan and uh, they include some, for example, meat jelly. And um, we are concerned about uh, the related problem. How can we ensure that the food is safe? Can the department give an account on food surveillance? Besides, at the beginning, our panel had said that we need to pay attention to um, food from Japan that may be affected by radiation. Now in Japan, as long as there is radiation certificate that the food can be imported. So has the CFS done even more stringent sampling? What is the situation now? For food imported from Japan, there are a lot of different uh, types and variety. And then re in relation to COVID-19, just now uh, we thank the administration's reply with the central government's support. Food supply is now quite stable. On the 8th of February meeting of this panel, well, we need to thank the central government for their help. Um, so there are marine and rail transports that are arranged, but I know that there are a number of cross border um, container truck drivers saying that there can be a closed loop management helping food to be supplied to Hong Kong via the uh, ground transport route. So how can we ensure that uh, um, supplies to Hong Kong will be more efficient? Administration, please. Thank you, Chairman. Let me take the third question first. The first question about online uh, food and Japanese food, I will defer to my colleague. Now, in relation to food supply during the fifth wave, one of the reasons is that the container drivers were uh, uh, infected or they are close contacts. So they had to undergo isolation in the mainland. So as a result, the number of logistic drivers is uh, significantly reduced in number, especially those working on supply of fresh food. So the task force has worked a lot on ground and marine transport to increase the number of uh, routes or channels. And then when local drivers go to mainland China, it is most important that they should not carry virus 
back to the mainland. So recently there are some new arrangements and that is at the four border control points, the drivers uh, need a certain uh, connection or go through some kind of connection and arrangement before they can um, take food. So in this way, the problem can be alleviated. So we have the responsibility to um, be the gatekeeper. And recently when local drivers leave our border control points and before they enter the mainland, they have to do a RAT. So uh, this can greatly reduce risk. So now I will pass the floor to my colleague. Okay, so can you please be brief? Uh, there isn't too much time. Okay, let me be brief. Thank you, Ms. Chen, for your question. Actually, we are very concerned about online shopping because online shopping is getting more and more widespread and there are regulations over food uh, online, provide online. So uh, first the food has to be safe and then concerning licensing, inspection and prosecution, work has been done too. At physical stores and also food samples, purchased via online, the um, actually the uh, failure rate of both uh, means is very similar. Later on, if there is time, I will ask Mr. Zhang to talk about licensing and inspection. Well, we have to uh, conclude this item at 5.30. So I don't think that will be uh, enough time. So you can provide a written response. And then uh, concerning the nuclear power incident in Japan, uh, Fukushima, uh, I hope that a uh, simple flowchart or a letter can be provided for uh, members because it has taken a long time already. So next time when we discuss the uh, nuclear incident, then I think uh, our understanding can be facilitated. Next, Mr. Chan Pui Lang. Thank you, Chairman. Two questions. One, about food safety surve uh, surveillance. In 2021, 66,300 food samples were checked, and that means 200 odd every day. And for online food, 5,242 samples, that is 14 samples daily on average. Well, with such a large uh, quantity or volume, will this number of samples uh, be a bit too small? What is the criterion adopted to lay down such a standard? What is the scientific basis? That's the first question. Secondly, about food supply. Well, uh, lorry drivers, some lorry drivers were infected. So that's why transport of food was affected. So later on, marine transport and trains um, were the solutions. So later in terms of food supply, will the marine route and also the, uh, uh, the designated train service be considered regular uh, solution for the problem. Okay, thank you. Let me answer the second question concerning the new marine route after it is uh, set. Um, operation has been more mature. And when we look at the inspection of cargo, the workflow uh, has already formed a habit. But how can we make it more permanent? Well, we can make arrangements later because if um, we are already used to some local suppliers and also um, if the merchants are of the view that such marine route is stable and there is not much cost implication that they will continue to use it. Of course, the government will have to liaise with these food and cargo suppliers so that they will use the marine route more. Then in the future, we can see how we can make it more permanent and even increase frequency. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chen, Mr. Chen, any follow-up? Concerning food sample surveillance. Yes, will there be two fuel samples? Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Wong, thank you, Mr. Chen. We understand that people are concerned about online purchase as such as now, looking at the surveillance numbers and licensing and inspection for online food and physical stores, the satisfaction or passing rate is more or less the same. But we do have planned that this year we will uh, enhance uh, the uh, inspection of samples to ensure safety. Mr. Chen, I'm not talking about enhancement. I'm asking about the number of samples. Uh, 
the number of samples. How did you determine the number of samples? So there are uh, a dozen or so samples checked every day for online food. So is this enough? Have you considered increasing the number? Yes, 60 odd thousand samples. Uh, will the number uh, be adequate or not? And then there are so many different types. We conduct a risk-based approach and we would uh, see what are the major main categories of uh, food intake among the members of public in Hong Kong. And uh, it's basically fruits and vegetable samples that, uh, we, uh, that uh, takes up the main part because uh, for the people of Hong Kong, um, they have consumed uh, a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables. So among the 66,000 um, 66, samples, there are over 20,000 of them are vegetables and fruit products. So that is uh, our basis. Second is a risk-based approach. For instance, for food coming in from Japan, we will then increase the sampling of uh, food importing from Japan. We do have a monitoring system, a daily monitoring system. We will look at the situation overseas and in Hong Kong to uh, keep a close eye on whether there are food incidents occurring. Well, Mr. Chen asked if you would increase the number of uh, the sample. For instance, for uh, a mid-autumn festival, you may be checking more on wound cakes, but then for other categories, that might be less samples, is that right? Well, every year it's about 65,000 uh, sam samples, but if necessary, we could increase the sample number of a certain category. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chen, that means they will not consider increasing the number of sampling. Next, Mr. Ten Carpio. Thank you, Chair. I have two questions, which are similar to what uh, my colleagues have raised. First, Will the government amend the existing ordinance so as to prohibit the use of uh, chemicals such as leaners and enhancing agents on meat? Because for our country, uh, this is already a zero tolerance and anything that is, uh, any food that has uh, the elements of this kind of agents would be prohibited from importing into the society. So for Hong Kong, are we still putting up with this kind of uh, chemicals or agents in our food? I hope that the government will be very clear on that. Are we going to amend the, uh, the ordinance so as to prohibit the import of pork, meat that have leaners enhancing agents? or other chemicals. Second, I understand that uh, from the promotion materials of the Japanese government, I understand that the uh, Japanese uh, government will dispose of the wastewater from the Fukushima into this, the open sea. So uh, I really don't trust them. Perhaps they have already uh, been doing so. You mentioned that uh, if there are incidents happening, you will increase the number of samples, but why not increasing the number of samples the, or food import samples from Japan? Because we have to be um, vigilant. Very often, perhaps they are already pouring these contaminated water into the open sea. So we are really very worried about it. Does the Hong Kong government have any proactive measures to guard against this. Are we just uh, sitting back and waiting uh, for the CFS to just uh, take some samples and conduct the um, investigation? Dr. Che? Two questions. First, about leaners enhancing agents, I'd like to ask Dr. Wang to answer. Regarding the uh, contaminated water from Japan, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lee will answer. Thank you. Regarding imported pork, we really are paying close attention. The government is uh, looking into the standards of uh, leanness enhancing agents uh, in imported pork. We hope that we will, uh, can soon come back to this panel to report to members about the progress of our work in this respect. 
Simply put, we will consider the whole picture, different elements, different considerations will be taken. Uh, first, we will take into the advice of the Food Safety Committee. We would also look into the source of imported pork, including mainland China, Brazil, and uh, other places, and look at their standards, their existing standards. We will also look into the um, eating habits of the citizen of Hong Kong, because our eating habit or food intake is a little bit different from people in the West. So we have to look into that. We will also consider the views of different stakeholders. Well, with all these factors taken into consideration, we will come back to this panel to report to members, hopefully within this year, and we will listen to your views as well. Second question. Yes, regarding the... Um, disposal of the contaminated water by the Japanese government into the sea. Well, since it's uh, the announcement of the Japanese government of its plan, we have already expressed our uh, great concern to the Japanese government regarding this. We have stated our stance uh, very clearly that the Japanese government should not uh, unilaterally dispose of the contaminated water into the open seas without the consent of the uh, um, global community. And regarding a flow chart or a work plan, well, the Tokyo Electricity Company has in last August announced that they will build a kind of underwater uh, tubes or uh, it's about a color, uh, one kilometer uh, beneath the surface of the sea to dispose of the wastewater. And they have submitted this design in, uh, in January. And they have also submitted an evaluation uh, report to the Japanese uh, relevant authority. And um, from the news that or uh, information that we have at hand, we understand that these um, designed or proposed arrangements have to have the approval of the Japanese um, uh, authorities in order to uh, start the plan. For the Japanese authority, they mentioned that they will consult uh, public views on the plan first. And the International um, Atomic uh, committee are uh, also looking into the plan and the proposed uh, plan of Japan. And in from uh, 14 to 18th of February and uh, 21 to 25th of March, uh, this uh, committee has gone to Japan to uh, look into the situation and discuss with uh, the Atomic Energy Committee of Japan. And um, according to the International Atomic Energy uh, in Institute, after the site visit for two times in Japan, they said that they will uh, release their report within two years. And they will also continue to uh, conduct uh, visits to the Japanese plants in order to evaluate the safety of uh, the Japanese authority in disposing of their contaminated water. So this is the present status. We will continue to keep a close eye on the work report of the International Atomic Energy Committee and their evaluation. Next. Mr. Leung Yuk Wai. Thank you, Chair. From the government's paper, I understand that uh, uh, they are keeping a close eye on the situation of imported food, especially under the pandemic situation. And, uh, and also they have established uh, guidelines and uh, workflow in conducting these uh, surveillance work. I also understand that uh, there are uh, online shopping, a uh, very frequent online shopping. And also um, there is uh, there are websites uh, saying that there could be cross-border trucks that would deliver um, food for people who have bought these uh, food items online. So they are actually sending uh, batches of food uh, from across the border to Hong Kong as a result of the online shopping. So uh, what is the surveillance of the food safety of, uh, of, of these food items? 
And also, uh, there are companies online stating that they have a food um, processing license. However, we can't be sure. There are also a lot of young people who like to do some startup business uh, who, um, on this. So how are we going to ensure that the food that they handle are safe? Dr. Wang, please. Thank you, Chair. Regarding online shopping, as mentioned before, we have uh, we do have sampling and testing of these. We have about 5,000 in 2021. We have altogether 5,000 over items from these online shopping. And we find that uh, the result or the passing rate is more or less the same as the physical stores. Uh, the uh, FEHD has also done a lot of work in uh, surveillance and also checking on the food safety of these items. Mr. Chen will supplement. Thank you, Chair. Regarding online shopping, we understand uh, the public's concern. We are in 2016, we started issuing permits for organizations uh, that handles uh, food uh, that needs uh, sales, sales permits. They have to apply for a license uh, from us. So this has already um, started in 2016. And uh, we have thousands of um, permits issued since then. So we, we will conduct uh, uh, site visits on these uh, food processing premises. And in 2021, we have conducted 2,264 um, visits or sites in, in, uh, in inspections. We will also go online and check their uh, web pages and see whether their, the information that they have given out uh, about their food are true and whether they comply with uh, our regulations. And uh, we have conducted over 2,300 uh, uh, online um, inspection in 2021. We would also uh, conduct a kind of um, decoy operations, that is, we will disguise as buyers and go online to buy from these uh, companies and see whether the food are up to standard and whether they're safe, the uh, way of transportation, storage and handling are, are hygienic and so forth. Thank you, Chair. All right, uh, Mr. Leung, your question uh, answered. Next, Mr. Yong. Yong Wing Kim. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to follow up on the issue of uh, online shopping. Just now, the CFS uh, representatives uh, uh, answered um, in a very evasive way. You just talk about uh, the local online shopping stores. What are what we want to know are uh, those companies of uh, overseas. There are overseas uh, food selling companies uh, that provide uh, online shopping. So are they safe? Well, in, in, that include imported pork and also uh, food imported from uh, high risk areas of Japan. Um, did you inspect these imported food items? Because uh, food safety of these items are, they are very important. It would affect directly the health of the people of Hong Kong for the online uh, food items. I don't know whether you have uh, sampling checks on these items. You always, you have been talking about local items, local sampling and testing. What about those from Taiwan, Japan, and other high-risk areas and countries? Do you do any inspection on these imported food items? Uh, controller of CFS. Uh, thank you, Chair. We Yes, we do pay a lot of attention to online shop, shopping, including those companies uh, from overseas. We work very closely with uh, the, the, our corresponding um, authorities overseas. Uh, for instance, for food item, for instance, game and meat, uh, poultry and so forth, we do have a regulation um, re uh, 
looking into the import of these items, they must uh, obtain uh, the kind of hygienic permit from us before they can be imported. Would you please switch off the microphone of, of Mr. Yuan Wen Kit first and then open, turn on the mic uh, of, the, uh, of the controller. Thank you. Let me say again, for games, meats, poultry, eggs, these are high risk food. So in the Hong Kong laws, there is regulation of these food. So when a batch of such food is imported, there must be health certificates issued locally or other form of written authorization. Just now, Mr. Yuan talked about mainland cross-border online sales. Now for mainland processing enterprises, they must be uh, accepted and authorized by the mainland authority. And we are in close contact with the mainland to step up such work. And for sampling, actually on different levels, there is sampling on imports, wholesale and retail levels. Just now, we also talked about imported pigs. In terms of testing and sampling, last year we enhanced sampling. Last year, concerning uh, sampling of the uh, beta um, agents, in 2021, 293 samples were tested on beta adrenergic agents, uh, agonists. And then uh, after that, 160 odd were done. From 2017 to 2022, in the first quarter, we have sampled 1,100 odd samples on uh, beta adrenergic um, agonists. So all the samples are in line with Hong Kong requirements. If there are no further questions, next, Ms. Chen Ho Yan. Yes, Chairman, my first question is, I am concerned about COVID-19 and also the risk on frozen food. In para 15 of the paper, it is stated that as of mid-March, well, I want to know since when till mid-March. So it is stated that more than 30,000 samples were tested. As we all remember last year at Tokwa Wan market, there were frozen, uh, fish samples from Indonesia that were tested positive and afterwards markets have to be disinfected and there, there was the need for uh, lab test. So concerning the 30,000 samples of frozen food, what is the percentage over the total? After mid-January in Hong Kong, uh, the pandemic actually experienced exponential uh, increase in terms of number of cases. Had CFS increased the number of sampling? Well, below four degrees Celsius, um, the virus can survive for a few weeks. So based on Hong Kong situation and also the outbreak, well, did the administration increase sampling? If not, I think uh, some attention has to be paid here. Then concerning slaughterhouse, apart from lack of vegetables, uh, there were problems with pigs as well. Even though the central government uh, supports us by uh, supplying live pigs to us, well, there are problems with the slaughterhouse. This is not the first time that there are problems with the slaughterhouse. Apart from Sheng Shui slaughterhouse, uh, there is also a private Chunwan slaughterhouse. And during the um, African uh, pig uh, pandemic issue, the private slaughterhouse has once suspended operation. So even if the central government gives us enough live pigs, if there is no slaughterhouse operation, if the government cannot um, influence the private slaughterhouses, then in the future, there may still be the chance of problem. No matter where the virus comes from, well, the government may not be able to have another slaughterhouse to work on the pigs for us. Number three, from this pandemic, we can see that apart from support from the central government, our local food supply chain is also important. We have to consider um, animal farms locally. Some um, um, 
small chickens or chicks were actually supplied from the mainland, but in Hong Kong, there was no incubator. So all along, there has not been enough support for the agricultural sector. So after taking into consideration this experience, should there be more resources for local farms so that their functions can be enhanced? Can there be uh, the installation of incubators so that we can reduce cost and we do have the capability to uh, incubate? Uh, the uh, live chickens. Okay, three questions. Thank you, Chairman. Let me answer the question about slaughterhouse. Now for slaughterhouse, actually, it is a very complicated operation system because we have mainland pigs, local pigs, and then in the whole industry, in the whole supply chain, there are buyers and uh, transport operators, and also, um, meat stores offering fresh pork. So all these chains are closely linked to each other. And then one month ago, there was the incident in Shangshui slaughterhouse because during that, that time, many workers were infected. So as a result, uh, one part of the supply chain was disrupted. Well, that was solved already. Now we have to think of how to deal with the risk from different elements. And then concerning the chicks, I think so far the problem has been solved because we are in active liaison with the task force on supplies uh, of food to Hong Kong. And uh, we said to them that there was a time when there was a shortage of chicks, but now it seems that the situation is normal. And then uh, there are small chickens being incubated um, by local chick farmers. And then uh, I think that problem was solved already. We will follow things up later. Now talking about testing of uh, frozen food, perhaps Dr. Wang can supplement. Yes, thank you, Chairman and Ms. Ms. Chen. We attach a lot of importance to the cold chain uh, sampling because inbound control measures are something that we have attached much importance to. In Hong Kong, we are talking about um, Hong Kong being a large food import center. And what we do is that we have set up a special team uh, to do surveillance. So what will, what will we look at? Every day, we refer to mainland customs announcement. And then in mainland provinces and cities, if there are frozen food, environmental samples or other samples bearing COVID virus, then we will check whether that batch has been sent to Hong Kong. We will keep in close contact with mainland China. Even if there isn't uh, such import to Hong Kong, then uh, we would still sample that uh, food in Hong Kong to enhance testing. Besides, uh, we do a hold and test um, work. So that means if there are positive food samples, we don't want them uh, to get into the market. I think the question is about numbers. I suggest that it is better for you to uh, provide some numbers. 30,000. So just now, um, Ms. Chen asked, since when? June 2020, according to our records. At that time, we realized that in the mainland, there are some reports. And so immediately we started our inbound control measures to take samples. In the past, well, we had already enhanced the uh, sampling number. Recently, because of the fifth wave, under the uh, Department of Health and also CHP, uh, we follow the standards on sampling number. So we have to strike a balance uh, with consideration given to the urgency. Well, during the fifth wave, some members are infected, members of the public are infected. So we, so we give priority to testing of uh, resident samples. But then of course, we also um, do surveillance of the cold chain um, in relation to the inbound control measures. Ms. Chen, I want to supplement since 2022 now, two years already, the number is too small. And then uh, I want to record a point. I, I'm not saying that the current problem needs to be solved. I've, I'm saying that additional resources should be offered to local farms to install incubators. Right, Tommy Zhang. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman, 
during my uh, term as a electrical counselor so far, uh, I have not experienced any funding work uh, as good as in the case of CFS. Well, in the past, uh, 10 odd years ago, uh, they were relied on to work on a lot of uh, samples and tests. Back then, 50 odd thousand, now 60 thousand. Well, things have been so complicated, but then so far they have not sought funding from us. Is it because they don't need additional manpower? They can do their own deployment. And are the labs good enough? Well, no matter what our colleagues say, the Japanese government is turning a blind eye to us almost. Well, I once said that the Japanese should be asked to uh, drink the water discharge from Fukushima and see whether they will have problem. Well, if after eight years, 10 years, they have no problem, then I'm fine. Uh, concerning CFS, I do support them, as you know, Uh, we always said that there is a lack of both chickens and ducks, and now there's a lack of hairy crabs. And uh, in the paper, uh, in item number 20 odd, it seems that uh, this matter is not being given much attention. Hairy crabs are very important. Uh, there's no hairy crab now. Why? Simple, because of dioxin. There are so many dioxin requirements and then uh, you are very unique. You keep on testing for dioxin and uh, people don't sell hairy crabs to you. And now uh, I know that hairy crabs have to fly to South Korea first and then come back. This is uh, not the right thing to do. Don't just tell me what the WHO is uh, doing. I am fine. I am fine with following the Chinese standards and WHO standards, but then the biggest problem is your, your bureau uh, has your own requirements. Even if the court rules that you should lose, um, there will only be dioxin problem after consuming a large number of crabs, hairy crabs. Well, um, I am fine even if I am to enter into another lawsuit with you. Uh, but you are not uh, paying attention to that. So I think you really need to work on Harry Krebs. Please don't waste our time. Our chairman is not that patient. But you have not answered my question. You are just uh, taking me round and round. I think your bureau should be the Home Affairs Bureau rather. Uh, and maybe AFCD is also uh, a suitable um, department for your portfolio because you always like to uh, take us to the gardens, right? I have said many times that there are problems with cross-border drivers. Our local chicken farms are very good and I don't understand why you want to stifle them and uh, you don't allow them to uh, rear more chickens. If they can rear more chickens, then there are better costs, uh, better economic benefits. Well, in Hong Kong, we have fresh chicken and we have a good brand. I don't know why up till now. You still follow the old way. Uh, Under secretary, you are not as old as I am. I think you should change, you should adapt. Our farmers are operating the chicken farms well. And uh, I think you should let them survive in a better way. Well, um, I only need a written response from you. Don't waste further time. Thank you, Mr. Tommy Zhang. Okay, so government, please answer those questions in writing. Next, Mr. Zhe Wai Chun. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, I want to ask, uh, page two of the paper, para five and six, um, metallic contaminants in food in 2021. So tests were done, 8,700 samples were tested. And then the satisfaction rate was 99.8%, which is high. And then um, in January, about fish balls, the Consumer Council said that there was mercury. There was too high concentration of mercury. Well, members of the public don't understand. You are the gatekeeper and uh, the satisfaction rate is 99.8. So people just uh, feel assured, but why such a problem? Is it because there are different standards? or they set too high standards and your standard is not the same. So what follow-up actions have you taken? Secondly, 
on para 13, so there are 111 licensed FPS and one market store, and then 51 uh, 50 blitz operations were carried out, and a total of 51 prosecutions were instituted. And then in 45 of the cases, um, convictions were done. Right. So is this very high? Uh, there are so many um, problems. So blitz operations were carried out. This is is it because uh, of unsatisfactory job in relation to meat inspection, or is it because the licensed FPS uh, are doing a very lousy job? The third question about the pandemic on Para 17, uh, it talks about uh, the sampling and testing work. What sort of uh, support would you give to the practitioners for those, for instance, who have not uh, completed with a vaccination? You mentioned that some will have to go through a testing at seven day uh, intervals. Three questions, uh, Dr. Choi. All right, uh, let me answer the third question. The government uh, has been paying attention to high risk practitioners in the trade and government required them to undergo testing at a regular basis and these are free. They could do it in the community testing centers and sometimes it would have outreach uh, services for them to conduct testing on site so uh, they can do it free of charge and they have to do it on a regular basis. I'd like to invite Dr. Wang to answer the first two questions. All right, uh, para five and six, regarding metallic contamination testing. Mr. J already mentioned that in 2021, we have uh, taken 8,700 samples. Um, there are virtual stores as well as online shops. Uh, samples are from these two, both included. And the Consumer Council also is working very closely with us. Every time when can the Consumer Council has a test report, we will uh, follow up with all the cases. and. Uh, we would also uh, conduct testing of, of these follow-up samples. For instance, for fish falls, if there are problems with the fish fall, we will then conduct more testing on the fish fall samples. But then uh, for different organizations, the testing objective uh, may be different. We are law on enforcing agency, so um, we would take the samples back to the government labs to decide whether the food is safe for consumption. We will also conduct a risk evaluation. If we find it uh, worrisome or if it exceeds the legal standards, or we will uh, follow up on the issue. Thank you. Next, Mr. Xiu Kafei. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question for the Under Secretary. I'm sorry, the mic is not coming through. Please start again. Yes, I'd like to ask the Under Secretary regarding fresh food. If uh, people buy fresh food online, for instance, uh, seafood or uh, beef for a hot spot, do they need to have a permit of the sales of these uh, food items online? Dr. Wang? Be it uh, fresh food, chilled food, or frozen meat, all these, the sales of these food items, they have to obtain a permit from the FEHD. Well, in recent months, I'm sure you noticed that there is an increase of sales of these uh, food items online. How many inspection exercises have you done on these uh, online food sales shops? I'd like to invite Mr. Dung to answer this question. Thank you, uh, Chairman. As uh, Dr. Wang just mentioned, for people who sell uh, restricted food online, for instance, uh, frozen food, they have to obtain a permit from us. In 2021, up to now, 
we have issued 1,632 such permits, some uh, for the sale of frozen food and some for uh, chilled meat. And uh, we have also conducted 2,000 uh, odd uh, inspection, on-site inspections of these companies. And we have to make sure that the information they provide online about their food items are uh, in line with the requirements of the um, set down in the permits. We would also go online to check uh, these uh, information that uh, they give out. In 2021, we have uh, conducted 2,363 such um, surveillance uh, exercises. And also we would go to their premises And uh, we would we have stopped disguising as uh, customers to buy food from them. Uh, in 2021, there are 298 such operations, decoy operations, and the passing rate is uh, satisfactory. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Dong a follow-up question. You mentioned uh, about the online uh, shops selling food. Do they need to? Uh, display their permit online. Well, they will have to uh, give us uh, their premises. We will uh, conduct on-site uh, inspection. They would also have to uh, display the permit number online. According to their regulations. Well, what I meant was that they have a web page, right? On the web page, will they show their foot Permit. Yes, they have to display the food permit online as well on their web page. All right, if that is the case, I think you should do more promotion. There are a lot of scams uh, online and um, there are many actually involved uh, food uh, sales. Some people pay uh, for food, but then they never get the, the, the food that they have ordered. You mentioned that there should be a display of their permit. Then uh, if that is the case, uh, the victims can actually go back to the web page and check the food permit numbers and then report it to the police or the customs um, department. Well, I think uh, this would deter people from uh, uh, doing bad things online because they have to display their food permit number. Yes, uh, we understand that, uh, for instance, for uh, Mid-Autumn Festival or major festival, there will be a lot of uh, online food sale exercises. The government actually, uh, if the government is not doing anything or if their law enforcement is not effective, people will lose confidence on these uh, online food sales and the the honest uh, seller would not be able to do business because customers have no faith in online food sale. Yes, I think since you have issued a food permit for them, you should actually publicize this and really require them to display their food permits online and then people will be able to check whether um, they are a genuine uh, or uh, up to standard uh, food seller. All right, in 2021, we have actually According to the complaints we received and information we obtained, we have uh, 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 conducted some uh, persecution. Uh, for instance, uh, some people uh, actually have do not have a food permit. We have actually made 44 such uh, prosecutions in 2021. All right, the next, uh, next is myself. First, I'd like to thank uh, members raising very relevant questions. First, talking about our a lack of chickens and duck for pigs. Also, we lack pig. Well, the central government has been very helpful and supportive. They know that uh, we are lacking in uh, the personnel working in a slaughterhouse. But um, of course, it is um, natural that some people may want to monopolize the market and uh, they might be resistant in having these personnel coming into Hong Kong to help out. And the result of which is that uh, people have to suffer from a uh, high, higher cost of uh, pork in the market. And I understand that at that time, uh, the net profit for each a single pig is about $10,000. And these businesses has, have been monopolized in the hands of a few 
uh, companies. Now that the situation has eased, I think the government should review the situation to look at the entire work process. Should we perhaps reconsider the entire workflow? It's not just the supply of pigs, but also, for instance, surveillance. The centralized surveillance, uh, it's a good practice because uh, we can uh, save on the land. Um, but then, because of that, some people may monopolize the situation because all pigs have to be slaughtered in their uh, specific or designated slaughterhouses. Second, about the uh, um, the chicks, import of chicks or chicken hatchlings, we also like to thank the FEHD for working uh, uh, very hard and uh, also the um, fisheries, uh, the AFCD also have been working very hard. But then we have been uh, running out of chicken hatchlings for about uh, uh, one and a half months. So uh, this has not been satisfactory. I hope that the government should also investigate into the um, pain points or the bottlenecks. Don't think only of uh, pork or vegetables. Actually, chicken ha um, hatchlings are also uh, having problems in being Im imported into Hong Kong. And I I understand that the government has uh, made amendments on the uh, removal or, or in the moving of the chicken farms in Hong Kong. At that time, uh, the electrical had not been in smooth operation. So I'd like to ask, um, uh, what is the situation now? Now that uh, um, things have become more smooth, I think we should really work, uh, do the real work and see uh, what improvement we can bring to the society. For instance, in developing uh, local industries, local agriculture and local uh, poultry um, farms uh, in the uh, relocation of these uh, premises, I think the government should really uh, give uh, or have more measures to uh, make it easier for them to relocate and redevelop. And also, I think we should not have double standards. We should really have a very uh, unified and uh, standards so that different um, trade know how to, uh, what, what is the standard. I think for, pigs coming from mainland or from overseas, I think we should have the uni uh, unified standard. I hope that uh, we can uh, uh, carry out parallel actions because uh, if you set out a very stringent requirement saying that there should not be any beta adrenaline uh, um, agonist in pox, then you should uphold the standard for those pox from in, coming from different places. You should be fair to all the suppliers. Well, we don't have time, so I hope that you will give us a written supply, a written reply on these points. There are two uh, colleagues who have raised their hands and myself included three altogether. So uh, we have to end by uh, 5.35. Uh, Shall we each have two minutes um, to conclude? All right. Mr. Tang, two minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. On the paper, I think uh, something is lacking. That is, we don't know we don't know how many samples or how many items have been detected from your sampling on problematic food items. For instance, items that are found with contaminants and so forth. In 2021 from Japan, we have taken over 9,000 samples, uh, food samples imported from Japan. What about the result? Is it zero? You found no items that have been contaminated at all? Or is it within a satisfactory level? Can you tell us that? Actually, all have passed our investigation, all have passed our examination. You mean they have all passed? That means zero, no items that are found uh, contaminated? Um, well, actually, we use two standards. First, an international standard that is uh, laid down by the Food uh, Safety Development Committee. And the Japanese government also has another standard, which is much lower. We have also looked into their standards. So for both standards, uh, uh, there are no items that have been found problematic or contaminated. Next, Mr. Chair Wei Jun. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to follow up on the three questions that I've asked just now. 
I think they have only answered one and a half of my questions. First, talking about standard, the Consumer Council standard, whether it is aligned with the uh, CFS. And next about uh, para 13, the prosecutions from 2019 to 2021, they have uh, blitz operations carried out. I, like, I asked uh, whether the result was uh, very unsatisfactory. First, about the uh, Consumer Council standard. For the Consumer Council, we work very closely with them. Just now we talk about me metallic contamination. Actually, uh, it uh, exists in the natural environment. And so we just uh, follow the standard uh, laid down by the Food Development Council. And we also have our local uh, the regulations laid down by our local government. We will carry out a risk-based base approach. If they exceed the standard, we will carry out prosecution. Chairman, does this mean that the Consumer Council has its own standards? The public will be confused if you have your own approach and Consumer Council has another. Dr. Wang, together with Consumer Council, we have a close communication mechanism, so we will relay our views to them. Consumer Council also considers consumers' requirements. As the chairman said just now, some people have zero tolerance and CFS is a law enforcement agency. We have to follow the laws and we also need to refer to food safety information to do follow up. Chairman, can there be a written reply from the administration on the blitz operations? So, okay, Secretariat, please take note of this question for further follow-up. Next, Mr. Tommy John, two minutes. Chairman, I don't need two minutes. Some colleagues made some points I need to respond. First, if uh, everything is not allowed in food, then we won't have anything to eat. If you talk about uh, radiation, contamination, di dioxin, and also antibiotics, and so on. The problem is, the matter is how much we can accept and what is meant by safety or safe. I would like to refer to Mr. Siokafai's point. Under Secretary, we all remember, you are actually testing our limit. Well, in the catering industry, we have made all the investment, we uh, have opened outlets, but then you do constant checks. And uh, for online food sale, you don't know where to find the operators. Two, three years ago, this panel has discussed, it is difficult to identify those online sellers. Are you going to buy the products? Are you going to check their websites? And then are you going to check whether the products are in line with the description? How can you arrest people? Things are difficult. So if we do not criticize that much, uh, you will try to pretend that you have done enough. Okay, so um, I don't need your response. Uh, these are my points. Thank you, Chairman. Two minutes for me. Just now I asked four questions. Apart from those, whenever supply is tight, there will be unscrupulous uh, businessmen. For example, uh, chilled meat being disguised as fresh meat and 51 prosecutions uh, were done. And in 45 cases, uh, there was conviction and penalties or fines. We know that it is difficult to collect evidence, but then the penalty is not high enough. After the stores are closed for some time, they will reappear very soon. There is $10,000 profit per pick. So because law enforcement is weak, they will continue to break the law. Will the SARG consider uh, refining or adjusting the fine? Are you going to criminalize the offense? I share Mr. Tommy Jung's view. We have to strike a balance. Concerning supply, if our standards get higher and higher, then business operation costs will also get higher. And there will be some people who, are, who dare not import some food. For example, hairy crabs. Hairy crabs have to go to Korea or even Japan. And then when, when, they, when these uh, products come back, they will be termed another name and sold at even higher price. For vegetables, again, they will become costlier. So um, I do not disagree with Mr. Tan Kapil, but this is a matter about consistent standards with our state. 
So I think we need to consider different consequences. If there are these standards, then uh, how many types of food will disappear. We have to consider first and then decide whether we really want to proceed with those standards. We should be science-based in terms of the amount of intake and uh, what will be the health impact. Perhaps there is no health impact, then we can do a, um, or we can make a correct decision. I hope more information can be given to members from food safety's point of view, I'm sure in the future, there will be this same discussion uh, every year. And I think it is good if you can prepare this paper in advance. If there is no comment from members, then we will conclude our discussion of this item. Then um, the administration uh, will have other representatives um, to discuss the next item. Next item is promoting the sustainable development of mariculture. So governments, can you take us through the paper? Uh, members, you don't need to raise hands now because we need to clear the signals first and then you can raise your hands after the administration's briefing, okay? I think uh, there will be a new group of uh, government representatives joining. Uh, so we have, um, we have Mr. Wang Yu-Chun, Mr. Mickey Lai, Mr. Patrick Lai, uh, and Mr. Chao Wing Kun, Senior Fisheries Officer from AFCD. Mr. Amara Wong is our PAS for Food and Health. Okay, Under Secretary, if you are ready, please start. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Chairman members, so this is a paper on promoting sustainable development of mariculture. All along, the government has been actively supporting modernization and sustainable development of local fisheries industry and enhancing their competitiveness through sustainable fisheries development funds. And under the national 14 five year plan, there are new opportunities for Hong Kong's fisheries industry. Uh, and uh, for deep sea mariculture last year, uh, at Tonglong Chao Fish Culture Zone, a modern mariculture demonstration farm was established by AFCD. And then it is different in terms of design, different from the traditional one. And uh, there is modernized uh, fish culture technique in order to test the ability of a large scale deep sea cage. And uh, the demonstration farm is also a um, knowledge transfer place. And it is a place for training and uh, further uh, education. And at Wang Chuk Kok, Hoi, uh, Outer Tat Moon, Mir Bay, and so on, four uh, F, uh, fish culture zones will be designated. And uh, modern uh, mariculture methods will be tested on. And then at the new FCZs, uh, there will be a few modernized uh, deep, uh, deep culture cage in order to encourage people to go for sustainable uh, mariculture methods. For the uh, new FCZs and the um, EIA, the necessary EIAs, they will be completed within this year. And then in Huizhou Industrial Park, uh, Guangdong Provincial Authority designated an area for Hong Kong mobile fishermen to develop deep sea mariculture. The government, uh, has approved about $15 million under the fund to support local fishermen in cooperating with designated mainland enterprises to participate in the development of deep sea mariculture in the GBA. The AFCD will take water samples for uh, sampling. And then um, there is the um, phytoplankton surveillance system uh, to guard against uh, potential hazard. And then there is also a fish health ma um, management scheme so on-site training is provided and by means of the fund, uh, Hong Kong City uh, University is, get, uh, is, uh, is getting some subsidy uh, to do the work. And then um, quality and safe brand um, will be built and there will be retail outlets and also mobile apps uh, known as uh, Local Fresh in order to publicize uh, our fish products and also the uh, sales channels in order to enhance competitiveness of our industry. Now I will play a video on the Tonglong Chao demonstration uh, farm. Thank you. Is the video long, uh, Under Secretary? Two minutes, two minutes, Chairman. Okay, uh, please try your best to be fast. Thank you.
So this is one way uh, of uh, deep sea marine culture. Um, and I think this is a very suitable way in Hong Kong uh, with good cost effectiveness. In Tonglong Chao, well, the environment is enough uh, for setting up this demonstration uh, zone. And then uh, it is a, a deep water one, a deep sea one. So uh, we have chosen um, a zone with um, the uh, deepest water and also with the best ability to withstand wind, uh, current, and also waves. At the same time, we are using smart systems uh, to do the work. So production capacity is very high. So, okay, in this demonstration area, there are some smart systems, including a real-time surveillance system and also water quality surveillance system. We also have automatic feeding system and also a, a heating system as well. So basically, um, we do researches at the same time training. For training, uh, there are theory lessons and also um, application classes. We do some uh, culture researches. Okay, so uh, I think, okay. Uh, in the future, if people have the aspiration to join the industry, then they will have some support and training. Yes. This is one way for them to get to know more about the industry. Okay, here you can see this um, trust, which is uh, very modernized and convenient. I think uh, fishermen will have easier life. And for people who will join this industry in the future, this is one way to reduce manpower requirement. Well, there are temperature changes in the sea. And the degree of salinity is different uh, between Eastern and Western waters. So um, there is a, no a lot of knowledge involved. Thank you. Any supplement from the administration? If not, then we will start now. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so members, if you have questions, please raise your hands. Uh, two, including myself, three. Okay, so five minutes for both question and answer. Three members, including me, Zhe Wai Chun and Chen Hua Yan. Uh, Mr. Zhe Wai Chun, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I support the promotion of sustainable development of merit culture. In the paper, para 327, the paper uh, talks about deep sea merit culture. Chairman, uh, I am not very familiar and knowledgeable with this, but then looking at the numbers, it seems that uh, the situation is quite okay. 66 trainees have been trained. So concerning these trainees, how can, how, how can they take more part in the future? What is the government going to do so that these trainees can apply what they learn? Besides, as you know, for deep sea mariculture, the amount of investment is big now. For traditional way, there's the need to change the traditional method. And I believe, well, since the administration is doing this good job, I hope the uh, government can do more help and give more support. P uh, page seven on publicity and market uh, development. As of February 2022, there are 77 uh, FCZs uh, joining the scheme, quality fish uh, scheme. Now, I know that it only accounts for 16% of the total licensed area. And you said there is still great potential. So why is it that the percentage is so low in the future? How are you going to enhance publicity and promotion? I want to understand more. Thank you. Right, government. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Lai to respond. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Te asked about the 66 uh, trainees. Some are members of the industry. Now through the training program, we hope that knowledge about deep sea mariculture can be 
uh, disseminated to them so that they can transform and then proceed with sustainable development. There are people who may aspire to joining the industry. If only training is delivered, that may not be enough to motivate them to join the industry. So in the paper, uh, we have set out other measures about the way forward. We hope that these people in the future will join the industry. At present, we are planning on designating new FCZs. This is important because right now concerning licensing, there are 900 odd licenses being granted. But then for FCZs, uh, there is area limit. So for a certain period of time, no new license was granted. By designating new FCZs, we hope that new licenses can be granted. So at least there is a license so that people can join the industry. Mr. They also mentioned that about uh, deep sea mariculture, they, he asked about the scale and the design. Well, at the initial stage, we have uh, injected um, a lot of investment because if we're going, we want to develop more new FCZs. The government may consider in these new FCZs set down some collaborative um, arrangements so that the beginners can start or try um, mariculture in these areas as a startup point, as a starting point. We also have a continuous development fund. It's called the Sustainable Fisheries Development Fund uh, to support deep sea mariculture activities. For people who want to join the industry, they could apply funding from this scheme and see whether they could join in uh, uh, certain schemes under the fund. Uh, regarding the accredited fish farm scheme, AFFS, we have 77 um, fishing units uh, joining the scheme. Of course, uh, the more the merrier. So we have to attract more uh, farms to join the scheme. And on the other hand, we want to come through the situation and help them solve the problem and see whether there are some bottlenecks. For instance, in publicizing and promoting their brands and also uh, uh, enlarging their sales points, the retail points and so forth. So uh, actually the Fish Marketing Organization and the AFCD have been doing a lot of work on this front. Next, Ms. Chen Hoi Yan. Thank you, Chair. Looking through the paper, I am in support of uh, the scheme, especially about the sustainable development of fisheries. You also mentioned that you hope that the uh, local fishermen can actually um, perhaps uh, change their trade or upgrade, but um, when they go out fishing, you, uh, I think you should uh, encourage them um, not just to participate in deep sea uh, mariculture, but also you should uh, understand the problem that they are facing, especially about illegal fishing because you want to support them to join a sustainable fisheries or fishing uh, development. But on the other hand, you should actually uh, prosecute illegal fishing and to curb this kind of illegal activities. And for retail points, there are only about 110 uh, uh, resale points. So I think it is not enough. You have to attract the fishermen to join the trade or to transform to uh, uh, conduct uh, sustainable development. You have to give in enough incentive. There should be more sales point. And on the paper, you mentioned about the uh, real-time monitoring and uh, also the uh, phytoplankton monitoring program. But if there are um, these situations occur, for instance, there will be harmful agar booms or red tides that would affect uh, their business. 
the business of the fishermen. Do you have some kind of basic um, protection for them against this kind of um, threat? Uh, Mr. Lai, please. Mr. Mickey Lai. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Chen, for your question. It is a global trend for the development of uh, fisheries. That is, uh, deep sea marine culture is uh, the trend worldwide. So I can boldly say that uh, our technology, the uh, marita mariculture technology uh, in Hong Kong is pretty mature and uh, the results uh, is pretty good. It's actually the quality of uh, the fish uh, are very good uh, through this uh, deep sea mariculture. We have mature technology and there are also special um, species that uh, they can um, keep in their fish farms. So we encourage them to transform or to upgrade themselves to participate in this sustainable deep sea mariculture, because we hope that ultimately um, people will understand that Hong Kong actually has a quali quality uh, fish product, a local fish product, the quality, the taste and every, and, and uh, um, hygienic situation and so forth are all very high, very good. So this is our ultimate aim. And the profits are actually uh, not bad. They can have uh, good returns from these um, food products. In doing a promotion, sometimes uh, we have to consider um, which points to stress. Uh, if we have a lot of sales point, on the other hand, we need to have enough supply for these sales point. So we have to really uh, coordinate. In the past years, we have been trying to do this coordinating job. So through the um, fish marketing organization, we liaise with the fishermen and uh, we try to make sure that uh, they can give us steady supply, steady fish supply. And with that, we can then go to check uh, whether we can expand the number of sales points, be it a virtual sales point or uh, online sales. With this, we can then encourage more people to join the trade. Ms. Chen also mentioned the problem about illegal fishing. Indeed, we understand that this is a problem. And we also hope that the situation can be rectified as soon as possible. We will make use of technology as much as possible and also work with uh, law enforcing agencies, both locally and uh, across the border to curb and to um, battle this illegal fishing problem. And regarding the... Um, people joining the trade, new people joining the trade, uh, can we provide some sort of basic um, guarantee or protection for them? Well, if they uh, aspire to join the industry, we do have a mechanism for them to uh, obtain uh, the fishing uh, permit uh, more easily. Because for now, if they want to do it, they have, uh, may have to find friends to uh, give them guarantee. But in the future, we will try to lower the uh, threshold so that if they they would be that would be easier for them to obtain a permit and to join the trade. And we we'll also have a um, funding scheme. If they lack fund, they could apply for these funding scheme in order to help them uh, start their trade or start their business in the industry. All right, my turn then. Uh, Ms. Chen mentioned about protection for the newcomer, for the uh, starters. Well, be it fishermen or farmers, we all hope to be able to have uh, insurance to insure us against uh, uh, natural harm or uh, other risks. But actually, the pool is very small. So, uh, it, so the um, insurance um, becomes uh, very expensive for us and it would not be, we would not be uh, able to support or to support this, uh, buying this kind of insurance. So we have to uh, resort to government support and government help. And because uh, even for, as you know, for farmers, we have to invest upfront uh, uh, before we can start growing. And can we perhaps look uh, inward? That is to look at the mainland market. The mainland actually has a relatively more mature 
uh, insurance uh, scheme, they do have a, a kind of uh, fisheries and agriculture insurance uh, program. Can we perhaps uh, try to see whether we could participate or join or buy insurance from them, from the mainland, because they have a very mature system. So um, even if uh, you add more uh, resales point, uh, it is still uh, risky for the farmers and the fishermen uh, because uh, there are high risks for, uh, for them. Next about the uh, structure, can we, uh, 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 Mr. Lai mentioned that the government would try to encourage people to join the industry and they would issue permit for them uh, more easily. But then I think sometimes the permit, uh, the permit are actually too restrictive, sometimes even for 90 meter kind of uh, uh, farm, very small, and then they have to apply for a, a, a permit. So I think you should perhaps uh, give or issue a permit for a bigger piece plot of land for a bigger piece of uh, farmland so that the farmer or the fisherman can then subdivide the, the place and then um, issue a kind of uh, permit for smaller farmers or for smaller fishermen uh, to do their trade within that bigger piece of land. That would reduce the risk and also it would also uh, um, it that then the fishermen would not need to uh, contact or delays with AFCD directly every time. Sometimes the people just uh, obtain a license, but actually they're not doing any fishing um, activities. Well, if you issue a bigger permit for a, a main fisherman uh, overlooking a bigger uh, sea uh, fish farm, then that, that it will be easier to operate and to avoid the aforementioned um, situation. Well, fishermen are really very difficult for uh, fishermen to uh, borrow loan or to apply for the for funding scheme. Can the government perhaps uh, try to in a uh, uh, pump? or in, uh, insert more money in this fund so that it will be easier for people to get loan or in order to start their fish farms because uh, if they have to start from zero um, it will be difficult for them and also for the management of the fish markets should actually be enhanced i'm not saying that the um, vmo is not doing a good job but i think uh, they are doing a limited job because they, they, they only overlooking the uh, buying and selling of fish. fish. We could perhaps draw reference from the Japanese fish, uh, fish marketing organization. For the uh, money that they make, perhaps uh, the FMO can perhaps uh, return, uh, return the profits, uh, some of the profits to the fishermen, and that would encourage them to, to thrive um, continuously. And in Hong Kong, if uh, there are FCZs established, then the area for um, trawling will be uh, decreased. So I hope that the government could uh, consider all these issues. And also regarding illegal fishing, um, it is actually harming the industry. I understand that in Weizhou, um, they actually, um, there are Weizhou Industrial Park um, that are actually uh, harming the fishing um, industry nearby. Well, we don't have any other members uh, who have raised hands. So uh, for the next round, uh, we can have four minutes each member for question and answer. I will perhaps uh, uh, give four minutes to demonstration to answer the questions that I've just asked. Mr. Lai, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I do agree. Uh, the mainland is doing quite a good job in the uh, fishing in the fishing industry. 
but then uh, in Hong Kong, because the market is uh, relatively smaller, it's more limited, and that's why it's more difficult for us to uh, promote or to have a bigger pool uh, for, in, um, for insurance of the fishermen. On mainland China, um, they are actually are having a lot of policy support in order to have such a um, big uh, scheme or uh, insurance scheme for the fishing for the fishery industry. We will go back and take a closer look at uh, what they're doing on the mainland. Yes, we agree that uh, insurance uh, scheme is very important for the fishermen, but then on the other hand, we hope that we could start from the basic and to reduce the risk for the fishermen. As mentioned about the red ties and the agro blooms, the um, AFCD has been using a lot of technology to monitor these uh, situation. We hope that we can have more timely alert. We, if we know that the situation is developing, we know and we know how much area it will be affected, we will be able to inform the fishermen uh, on a timely manner so that uh, they can start their precautious measures ASAP. We also have a deep water uh, uh, kind of tank, uh, which are water and uh, wave and wave and wind resistant. So this kind of high density polyethylene cages will be able to reduce the risk for the uh, fishermen. We really don't want to see the fishing industry is being harmed by the uh, inclement weather or the things that they can control. Even though we have an emergency assistance scheme to help them out, it would not be a good thing for them to suffer this kind of loss uh, time and again. I'd like to supplement. I hope that the government can have a new mindset. It's not to say that uh, it is difficult and uh, you can get, yeah, make a, a stronger cages uh, which are wave and wind resistant. I think uh, you are not being proactive enough. Chairman also talked about loans. Under AFCD and the government, there are different loan funds and there is also the agriculture. Uh, the, there is also the fishery development fund. In mid February, we launched a pilot scheme. The goal is that through the fund, well, people can be assisted if they would like to join the industry uh, to do deep water mariculture. Then uh, they can get some funding support. Besides, there is one thing that we emphasize. In the industry, apart from technology and training, we hope we, we think that the main direction is to encourage the industry to go for intensified development. Chairman, you are right. Concerning risk, if one or two fishermen uh, carry out deep water mariculture, the risk is high. However, if uh, there is development over a mass scale, if the um, fishermen can be organized and then they can share the risk, then the risk per fisherman will be smaller. And through the fund itself, well, actually the fund can help applicants and participants to take on half of the risk. So we hope to encourage people to join the industry so that uh, risk can be reduced. Chairman, you also referred to the designation of new FCZs. So will that be conflict with the capture fishermen? In fact, with new FCZs, there can't be further um, uh, fishing in the water. And of course the fish are there, but then for the capture fishermen, the water bodies that get, they can operate in is smaller. We understand that. So in the EIA, we are very careful on the impact on the capture fishermen. As I said just now, we hope that some uh, capture fishermen can check whether there is some room or opportunities 
so that they can change from being capture fishermen to uh, culture uh, operators. Because apart from us, actually in our states and also globally, uh, there is this trend. So basically that's my answer, right. Uh, if necessary, you can supplement in writing. Mr. Zhe Wai Chun and Ms. Chen Hua Yan. Mr. Zhe, uh, thank you, Chairman. I would like to make the following points. Number one, all along, I support diversification of industries in Hong Kong. We should not concentrate on one or two leading industries. So concerning fishery and agriculture, the government should do more to make adjustments so that those who aspire to join the industries can have an objective environment for them to continue to work. So um, in all industries, there can be some excellent players. So looking at the numbers, I think the government has not done enough. As the chairman said, there may be problems with the system and in the laws. Now, if you talk about the use of fishing rafts as uh, culture zones. Well, reading from the information in 1990, the amount of production volume was uh, 3,000 metric tons and in 2020, 600 odd metric tons. There is a big decline. So what were the problems? Of course, I don't want the government to give up on this industry. This is not right. This is a negative attitude. I think they should be more positive. So now we are talking about this deep sea mariculture method. So can the industry enjoy sustainable development with this single method? Is this the only method? Is the government thinking of other measures so that there will be really sustainable development? Well, production volume is coming down and this does not happen on one day. There has been some time already. So is the government reviewing how to achieve sustainable development? Looking at the timetable and also production volume, I don't think the situation is right. It reflects that uh, not enough work has been done. So has the government done an overall review? So this time we are only talking about one or two measures to help the situation. I want more understanding. Thank you. Mr. Lai? Mr. Lai? Yes, thank you, Mr. Zhe, for the question. Let me put it this way. The SARG or the AFCD would like to promote sustainable development in the industry. And we uh, have been actively working on measures. So regarding deep sea mariculture, um, technology is one part of it. Another part is that we need infrastructure. As such as now there will be new FCZs, I can share with you some figures for reference. In the future, if we are able to have four new FCZs, then we believe that if these FCZs uh, can grant licenses to operators, then production volume can reach 5,000 metric tons. Comparing with the 90s, comparing with the peak in the 90s, uh, we will see a higher level. So we are not only aiming at high production volume, as stated in the paper. Apart from production volume, we hope that the industry can work on other directions, apart from fish culture can more productive species be considered, for example, pearl oysters and uh, local spiny lobsters? Well, through the fund, we do have plans to bring in these new species. So we hope the industry can uh, have more diversified development. Another point is, apart from opportunities in Hong Kong, we are also working with 
Guangdong province and the state. We are in close liaison with them. Hong Kong may be a bottleneck, so we encourage members of the industry to go to Greater Bay Area to strive for better development. Starting last year, the industry organized uh, a delegation to Huizhou Industrial Park, and they have worked there for one year. And recently they are working on a deep sea mariculture. So things start to bear fruit. In the future, in the fish culture sector, uh, there would be big room for development. There are people who had left, there are people who had not been active. We hope to encourage them to be active again, or as such as now, we'd like to attract some newcomers to join the industry so that the industry can be rejuvenated. Okay, thank you. Mr. Siu Kafai, I just saw that you had raised your hand. Uh, he has waited for a long time. So after four minutes, I will give you all the time, okay? Um, so thank you, Mr. Xiu. Uh, Ms. Chen Huayan, four minutes. I will manage time tightly. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I support sustainability of the fishery industry. As the director said, the quality of the fish will be close to um, sea fish. Well, I uh, buy food from the market every day. When the retailer says that a fish is sea fish, it is much more expensive. So as long as there is profit to make, I think fishermen will be more than happy to develop in that area. So can more publicity be done or more creative publicity be done? Referring to para 20 of the paper, you said that by means of different promotion activities, you um, publicize uh, local good quality products, but then there are only uh, like 113 retail outlets offering such products. Now, every day, every morning, I go to Kowloon City Market. A few weeks ago, there was no live pork, no beef. And there are a lot more women buying fish. But do we know that they are from uh, AFFS? Well, we really don't know. We only know that some are seafood and some are, fr are from certain areas. Well, this year there was the uh, pandemic and uh, there is no longer the uh, carnival on uh, quality food. So what is your future publicity direction? Secondly, all over the world, people are talking about uh, shifting from capturing to culturing, but then Fish capturing is still one way uh, for fishermen to make the living. So concerning illegal fishing, I think you need to strengthen your efforts. Even though you want to promote deep sea mariculture, um, illegal fishing is something that you should not reduce manpower on. So you have to increase manpower to tackle illegal fishing so as to help the fishermen. This is very important. Thank you. Government, Mr. Lai. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Chan. I totally agree. In terms of publicity, we have to strengthen our efforts. And then I hope that Ms. Chan can try our quality products locally. And after that, you may realize that the quality does not differ much from uh, captured fish. Well, under the pandemic, publicity uh, approach has changed because concerning physical uh, publicity events, they are no longer possible. So many people can only stay at home. So by means of some online platforms, and also online uh, purchase, but we have done a lot to promote the quality fish. If the pandemic situation so allows, as Ms. Chen said, every year we take part in large scale trade fairs of agricultural and fishery products. We had organized the uh, quality food carnival and there are expos on uh, nice food as well together with retail outlets like supermarkets and healthy 
uh, health health food supplement uh, outlets, we organize regular publicity and promotion. For example, small gifts are uh, given to people and uh, discounts are offered so that people will try local quality food. In the future, we will do more um, so as to make sure that our effort is sustainable. Then concerning capture fishery, well, we need to combat illegal fishing. We will um, strengthen our efforts. In the past, locally in the Hong Kong water bodies, we work with the marine police a lot. So we will liaise with the relevant departments to see how we can better combat illegal fishing. And sometimes there are mainland vessels coming to Hong Kong and uh, we work with Guangdong province uh, related departments. So in many cases, we have referred cases to them for follow-up. We will definitely step up our effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think for illegal fishing, well, this item will definitely come back to our panel. Next, Mr. Shuka Kui and then Mr. Tan Ka Kyu, each five minutes. Uh, if need be, we will extend the meeting for 15 minutes. But if not, we uh, would not need to extend it. Well, about three years ago, a, per a person from the industry uh, mentioned to me that uh, he applied from AFCD. He wants to uh, culture pearl oysters in Hong Kong. Well, I remember I've asked uh, my colleagues to help him out and AFCD had been very efficient. And this friend of mine, about a year ago, I met him up and then I asked uh, what's uh, happening. Uh, and he said, it's very good. Business has been doing well. Um, he has said that actually a lot of Hong Kong people would uh, go to his shops and to play or to uh, uh, to buy a uh, pearl from him. So even with the pandemic, his business has been doing well. So this is a success case. And uh, with the help of the government, uh, this person, this friend of mine has been able to um, conduct a pearl oysters culture in Hong Kong. So um, I think this is a good uh, case in point showing that a, su a relevant support of, and timely support of the government would be uh, very helpful and conducive to the success of local businesses. And it's a very encouraging case. And very heartening to see such a case. Well, just now you mentioned about the uh, high density polyethylene cages. Well, yes, I've uh, seen this and on mainland China, actually, they have actually done uh, a much better job. They have bigger cages, very sturdy, and they put it down under the sea. And because you can uh, uh, harvest the kind of uh, uh, natural resources that is a fish, resources from the sea. So I think it is a pretty good idea. Well, uh, from the video you played just now, I think it's more or less the same. Your cage is sort of rectangular and theirs is a circular kind of cages. Uh, anyway, it's a good try. And you mentioned that there will be four such uh, operations and every year there will be about 5,000 tons of uh, um, uh, fishery products. But uh, what sort of financial returns will be, can be generated and how many people or local fishermen you expect would join in the scheme? Thank you, Mr. Xiu, for your question and thank you for your support and encouragement. We talked about the four uh, systems, four cages. There would be uh, actually four new FCZs, what we mentioned were the fish culture zones. Um, I don't know whether we have the updated figure at hand. Uh, we mentioned just now that during the 90s, we have about uh, 3,000 tons of output. Uh, at that time, the uh, financial uh, profit generated was about uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. But uh, for this time, 5,000 tons uh, would be um, more or less correct or a, a good guesstimate. We also mentioned about uh, fresh seafood. Hong Kong people really love seafood. Um, talking about mariculture in Hong Kong, there are a lot of uh, fish products uh, that are uh, uh, fresh uh, seafood. So we have to 
well, this is actually a very, we have an important role to play for these FCZs. We have an important role to play for the supply of live seafood in Hong Kong markets. Any follow up? Well, you mentioned about four FCZs. How many cages uh, will each FCZ be able to, uh, to have? Well, that depends on the area of the FCZs. We will uh, work on it. I think for the biggest FCZ, there will be at least 10 or eight to 10 such cages. But of course, uh, well, we may not uh, use uh, or use this kind of um, high density cages because it depends on the uh, water current and the, um, the situation. We hope to be able to optimize the space of the FCZ there might be some uh, circular cages or rectangular cages, uh, the purpose of which is to maximize or fully utilize the um, space of the FCZ. The water body is also very precious for us, so we have to optimize them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well, actually in the 50s or 60s, uh, Hong Kong already have uh, local farmers or local fishermen. Next is Tenka Biu, five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Well, today's uh, introduction from the administration really get, has given us hope in the development of local industries, both uh, fisheries and also agricultural industries. And also the government has been uh, working hard, doing very good on it. And uh, um, the most uh, encouraging is to really uh, to walk the walk, not just talk to talk. So I have a few points to raise. First, about the distribution of the FCZ. Hong Kong is a small area. But then uh, what about the uh, in the east, for instance, in Sai Kong, in uh, Po Toi Island, and also in the west, uh, Pearl River Delta, Tai O, and facing the Pearl River, the kind of fish species would be very different because one is a kind of intersection between the sea and the rivers. The other one is facing the mainland. I'd like to hear from the experts. But will that be any um, major difference in the fish species in these two different areas? Next, about a collaboration with the Greater Bay Area. You mentioned about uh, Hui Zhou um, in um, Pearl River and also uh, Jiangmen. Also, we could perhaps also collaborate with Macau and other coastal cities in the GBA. Uh, what is the prospect of this col collaboration? And third, how can we enrich our uh, uh, talents pool, uh, manpower, and also the species? And actually, you mentioned, uh, uh, a colleague mentioned that there could be a kind of experimental tourism developed. Well, uh, there could be a kind of uh, uh, local tours that bring people to visit the kind of um, uh, fishing uh, racks in, in Hong Kong. Um, and also they can enjoy the fresh seafood uh, there. And also about local talents. Do we have enough young people uh, who are interested in joining this uh, industry? Do we ha have enough incentives for them to join in? Uh, Mr. Lai. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Tang, for your questions. We are planning for four FCZs. They are distributed, they are in different areas. One in the Northern Territory in Taipang Bay, there will be one FCZ. And then as mentioned by Mr. Tang in Po Toi, East and, uh, uh, east and South of Po Toi. And also in the North, there will be another FCZ. All in all, there will be four fish culture zones. Uh, in the West, uh, there are limited uh, waters that are suitable for the establishment of FCZ because there are a lot of uh, um, water activities going on there. So um, we really need to find a bigger space to establish an FCZ. And that is why we will concentrate on the south, the north and the east northern areas of Hong Kong to establish the FCZs. Regarding collaboration with mainland, we 
actually have knocked on the door of different cities in the Greater Bay Area. In Guangdong province, uh, the Huizhou Industrial Park has responded to us. We already have a program going on with them. Well, it doesn't mean that we won't uh, go on to knock at the doors of other cities. For instance, in the West, uh, in, Zhu, in Pearl River, in Jiangmen and other cities, we actually have also been uh, trying to uh, contact them and trying to see, explore whether there could be collaboration projects uh, with them. We, uh, these are continuous efforts. We will continue to conduct these uh, work regarding the enrichment of our fishery products. Well, as mentioned, uh, in addition to uh, culture, we could, through the cultural mariculture activity, we could actually introduce some kind of local experience, uh, experiential tours that could act, uh, add value to the fishery, local fishery industries. We do agree. So under the fund, the Sustainable Fisheries Development Fund, there are a few programs that would help people of the industries to conduct not just the conventional fishery industry that is trawling or uh, mariculture, but also to perhaps uh, provide some kind of um, activities or local uh, tourism. This would give them another perhaps additional source of income. Um, we, are, we will help them uh, uh, in doing this. For nurturing of local talents, yes, indeed, we really hope that uh, more local young people would be interested to join the industry. We, we, we also uh, have seen the participation of the set, second generation of local fishermen joining or continuing on in the industry. We are happy to see that. And actually, uh, there are some young, uh, quite a few of young people, for instance, in their 20s or 30s who are interested in fisheries and uh, they have joined our programs. Well, we need, of course, to continue to encourage them. We need to uh, roll out more supporting schemes so that uh, uh, they will continue to stay on and we can continue to attract more young people to join the industry. Thank you, Chen. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, uh, please give me one more minute to conclude. Just now, uh, I heard uh, Mr. Lai uh, said that the, uh, the we can produce quality uh, fishery products through uh, mariculture. Well, this is encouraging, but then I hope that we can have stable quality. We can control uh, uh, the quality at a high level. As Ms. Chen Hua Yan mentioned, uh, people have the perception that uh, sea water fish is better. They are willing to pay more for sea, wa uh, sea water fish uh, instead of cultured fish. But I think the government should step up with its uh, promotion activities so that uh, local people would welcome or would like to uh, try uh, the local cultured fish. Otherwise, uh, the prices cannot uh, be higher. So it's not just publicity, but then for the sales retail channels, for instance, a fish marketing organization, a fish market, can we perhaps have a designated store for the, a store to sell local fish products? In that case, the uh, citizens will be able to have uh, the opportunity to try on these local fish products. Well, if members do not have further questions, uh, this would be the end for the discussion of the item. The last item, any other business? We do not have AOB. So uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. And thank, we'd like to thank the administration and the members for participating in the meeting, meeting adjourned.